Well, I just want to welcome everyone uh, for joining us today. It is Women's um, History Month, and this is some, uh, it's such an incredible month because, one, we should always be doing the work to promote women's um, women's rights and recognizing women's leaders, but it's nice to have one month just dedicated to that. And um, I think women's health is such an important and integral part of talking about uh, in Women's History Month because women have been, you know, historically been left out of like, um, re, you know, research and it has been left out of just a lot of considerations um, when it comes to developing medicine, developing um, technologies and um, even like questionnaires when you go into the doctor's office. Um, so um, it, it's really up to us to, to keep advocating and um, recognizing that we're just not smaller sized men <laughs> when it comes to medicine. And, and um, we have unique, uh, a unique biology that, that it's not, it doesn't make us weaker and it doesn't make us any less, but it's just different. And it's a different way of being. And um, I really wanna emphasize that throughout today's talk. Um, and I, I think we can be really empowered and uh, change the narrative on the way we talk about women's health also. Um, and just a little bit about me. Um, my name is Misha. I um, live in San Francisco and I have been practicing as a nutritionist, as a health coach for over 10 years. I have a background in clinical research. I actually used to do um, pediatrics, HIV research and addictions research as well. And so I really like to um, talk about um, healthcare as prevention, but also how to really take care of yourself once you are sick and um, what are all the tools you can use. It's not, to, you know, and there's so many tools we can use that are outside of the doctor's office, that's outside of just um, prescriptions and um, the traditional model. And um, so that's just a little bit about me and I'm gonna do a screen share and go over a presentation on women's health. And if you have any questions, feel free to just stop me right there and ask or um, drop something in the chat box and I'll be sure to answer all the questions at the end. Um, okay, so um, let's start at the beginning. Okay, so this is my nutritionist guide to women's health. And um, I just kind of described myself a little bit. Um, I wanna talk about the menstrual cycle as a starting point for women's health, because this is something that it's often not talked about in death. <laughs> and when we're trying to understand women's health, it, this is so important, you know, because it really makes up who we are as women or as people assigned female at birth. Um, and um, the menstrual cycle is considered the fifth vital sign. Uh, and so vital signs are things like when you go to the doctor's office and the nurse takes your pulse, they, uh, they take your temperature, your heart rate, your, um, um, and so the fifth one is the menstrual cycle. And so what that means is when you go to the doctor's office, you should be having at least one conversation about how your period is um, if you are bleeding um, and if you're um, if you're still menstruating, you know, if you um, if you're beyond the menstrual age, um, then of course the conversation will be different. There is another conversation to have at that point, but um, right now just focusing on that. Um, and it starts as soon as you start your period. Um, and because hormonal imbalances actually really do start in your team. And um, the earlier we can address hormonal imbalances, the better experience you can have, you know, health experience you can have. Um, there's no point in suffering from PCOS, fibroids, and endometriosis uh, at the age of 13 until you're like 35 and finally someone um, diagnoses you because um, the, the number one thing doctors and OBGYNs recommend is the pill. But what the pill often does is mask a lot of symptoms, um, they don't really 
course correct what's going on. So when you go into the doctor's office, making sure you're asking, they're asking questions, you're asking questions, and really, even if they feel uncomfortable, um, you should be really talking about this there. Um, and just knowing that when um, your the menstrual cycle is related to things like um, heart disease, it's related to things like breast cancer, it's related to even it could be even related to like hypothyroidism. So it's not just about like if you're fertile or not fertile, it really is about um, all the other ways your body functions, even your brain health. Um, there's research going on about unlinking menstrual cycle to dementia now. And so understanding what's healthy and not healthy is critical. Um, just some facts like women who have regular menstrual cycles have a lower risk for heart disease than men of the same age or women who no longer have menstrual cycles. So our periods keep us heart healthy too, as long as our periods are healthy. Um, we can, so that's just something to, you know, a few facts about the menstrual cycle. Um, and I'll really go into like how to, what is a healthy menstrual cycle and how to keep a healthy menstrual cycle, achieve it. Um, and then what to do also if you're no longer in, um, you know, if you're postmenopausal. So there are four cycle, four phases to your menstrual cycle. And um, um, your menstrual cycle is about, it's not just when you're on your period, it's the entire month. So men, um, and when I say men, I'm, I'm I'm, and women, I'm really talking about what you were assigned or what people were assigned when they were um, born. And, um, and so if you are a menstruator, a normal menstruator um, cycle looks like anywhere from 23 to 33 days. So there is no perfect length of a menstrual cycle. It's not like the perfect 28 that you always see um, referenced um, when we're talking about the menstrual cycle. But um, for someone, 23 days can be a typical cycle as long as it's consistent. Um, and 33 days is normal too, as long as it's consistent. Um, and women, we go through this, uh, our, our, we don't just have a circadian rhythm, we have a infraradian rhythm too. So our circadian rhythm is like we cycle on a 24 hour clock, right? And that's when your cortisol peaks in the morning and your melatonin peaks at night and it helps us go to sleep. And men are on this 24 hour cycle consistently. Women, we have our 24 hour cycle, but we also have our menstrual cycle. That is also a, a biorhythm for us that lets us know what's happening in our body because from week to week, we are a, basically a different person, a different being the way our hormones are surging and dropping. And so this is also really important to understand when it comes to health. And so your menstrual phase is this phase that you're, you bleed through. It's typically one to six days um, or days one to six. Um, you don't want a menstrual cycle that's less than three days of bleeding because that might mean that you're not, you might not have enough iron or you're not producing enough, um, um, building enough estrogen throughout the month. Um, it could mean that you have really low estrogen. Um, this is, and then you get into the follicular phase right here. Um, I always say this is the feel good phase of a woman. So if you are into cycle tracking and you start noticing your moods, um, this is probably this, uh, phase of the cycle. We feel really good. Like you're, you're going to want to go out, make plans, um, really great time to make, uh, set up meetings, um, you know, kind of organize your life a little bit here. This is when your uterine lining starts building and your estrogen is surging. Um, and then you hit the ovulation phase. So ovulation phase happens kind of right in the middle of your cycle, but it can be about five days long. So if you're just trying to get pregnant or you're trying to avoid pregnant, this is your most fertile days. Um, and um, you can tell how fertile you are is by how wet you get um, and how thick the mucus is. Um, and if you're not getting wet and that mucus is not happening, and this is without stimulation, 
Um, there could be um, something going on with the estrogen um, or even testosterone. And so something to even like, we, there are all these telltale signs our body tells us about hormones that are happening in our body. And then after ovulation, um, after the egg drops, um, and if you don't get pregnant by the, in the next 24 hours, you enter the luteal phase. And this is where your progesterone surges and your estrogen starts dropping. Um, this is where a lot of women experience um, period pains, um, mood, um, mood fluctuations. And a little bit of that is normal. But if for a good two weeks, you're having extreme mood imbalances, it could be something called PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is, um, which really puts women at risk for even suicide. And so this is something that we need to pay attention to. So even having a stress, stressful event in the follicular phase, a person may be, feel more resilient to handle that stress, but when you hit, get hit with some really bad news in your luteal phase, it can emotionally hit you more. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, as long as we have tools in place to handle that stress um, and outlets to, um, to, you know, work out some of the tension, but this is something really important for doctors to understand. So unfortunately, a lot of younger girls are being di diagnosed for like um, bipolar and a lot of things, which it could be valid, but it could just be that they're in their luteal phase and they might even have just PMDD. Um, so um, it's really important to you know, have these conversations with a doctor, can do some research on hand and bring this information to the doctor as well, or a psychiatrist. Um, Cause you don't want to be misdiagnosed. Um, and there's a lot that, you know, I, I'm, for today's talk, I'm not going to go into the different phases of the cycle and what you could do. And, but there's a lot you could do with, in terms of like movement and nutrition for each phase to strengthen um, and have, uh, just have a better month, you know, up month after month. Um, but I'm going to just go more in general, for, just for sake of time. And then um, if anyone's really interested in, you know, talking and learning more with me, um, do contact me. So moon cycle mapping or cycle mapping, uh, cycle syncing, there are lots of names out there for it, but it's a way to track your entire cycle each month and cultivate awareness that constant hormonal shifts have valid physical, emotional, and energetic shifts. And this knowledge can be used to help you design your most aligned, vibrant, and easeful life by creating a loving and harmonious relationship with yourself. Um, and so, you know, you can download an app to do this. You can do paper charting. Um, there's, it's really easy now. There are so many apps that have like cycle trackers, but you want to be also tracking your moods. You want to be tracking health symptoms like headaches, backaches, tender breasts, all of that as well. Not just, um, and then you want to track also like the length of your periods. And, um, so like a healthy period, um, Okay, um, a healthy period would look like, you know, something that's about three to four days or a little bit longer too. It's especially as you're younger, your periods tend to be longer and heavier. And as you get older and close to perimenopause in your early forties, um, they become a little bit lighter and shorter. You want your periods to be kind of um, in, the, in the red, um, like cherry red type of color. Um, you don't want it to be too dark and you don't want it to be too light because those are all indications and you don't want too many clumps in your period as well, because um, um, those could, could indicate fibroids or it could indicate really old blood or just not enough iron in your body as well. So kind of, you know, liquidy, not too many clumps, a good color, no odor or not, not a strong odor. Um, and those all indicate your health. Something that's so important when we're talking about women's health is also talking about gut health. Um, and this is also tied to your, to your reproductive health as well. So the better your and um, stronger your digestion is and your ability to 
uh, assimilate food, absorb nutrients, um, the better periods you will have too. And not just periods, the better postmenopausal experience you'll have. Um, and so even if you're like getting to that, you know, if you're in that perimenopause or you're, and, and you're starting to start feeling all of those, um, those symptoms that come along with the menopause, um, fixing your gut health can actually fix a lot of the, the, you know, like hot flashes and things, all of those things can actually be addressed um, with, by just nutrition and um, addressing anything that's going on in your gut health. And it's, it's, it seems so disconnected, but um, the research is now out there. And, and this is something a lot of communities um, around the world have known. It hasn't really made it into modern medicine, but if you think about like Ayurvedic medicine or traditional Chinese medicine, um, all of those um, have always recognized the importance of gut health for overall health. And so in our gut health, oh, yes, go ahead. Now. I had a quick question because it's so fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it's probably right mm -hmm. on point with what you're talking about. Going back when you talked about that luteal phase, uh, phase three, with the relationship uh -huh. between progesterone and estrogen drops and mood and affect with this uh, PMDD, you know, the dysmorphia mm -hmm. with depression or anxiety or whatever it is. I was wondering a question about that in the microbiome and has there been any research that really relates specifically drops in estrogen or progesterone not boosting enough during that phase that's related to dysbiosis or problems within the microbiome itself? Yeah, I can tell you that um, women's health is so under researched that mm -hmm. like PMDD is not even on the radar, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and like it, it's endometriosis awareness month and that's so under researched too, but whatever little research there is does indicate like with endometriosis that there is, um, there is a lot going on in the gut and you could find those endometrial cells all around the gut as well that are inflamed. So, um, and what I can tell you from other studies with just related to the microbiome and dysbiosis and dysbiosis means that there's an imbalance of the good um, and healthy bacteria in your gut, um, that there is a link to dysbiosis and depression. There is a, a very, very strong connection between depression and anxiety and gut health. And, and so we know that the gut health, our gut actually, the neurons in our gut are sending more messengers and more, um, more signals to our brain than our brain is actually sending to our gut. So it is a two-way highway, but there, there are more lanes going up to our gut than um, up, up to our brain than to our um, the other way around. And so we know that there are serotonin and dopamine in our gut. And so if we're not eating the right things, we're basically not nourishing those microbes that would help us produce that serotonin, that like give us that dopamine hit. And that's why so many times we like go and rush for like things like sugar because it lights up our brain waves. But when we're eating sugar, it gives us that temporary fix, right? It lights up our brain waves in our brain where the dopamine centers are. But at the same time, we're depleting the dopamine serotonin um, in our gut because it's sugar and sugar actually takes more vitamins that are stored in our body to break down than actually give us vitamins, right? And minerals and all the nutrients. But so over time, if we keep eating things like sweet potato instead, which also has that sweet taste and maybe with a little, if you really need something sweet, a little drizzle of maple syrup on it, not only are we lighting up our brain centers, we're also feeding our gut microbiota, which then in turn is going to make our are um, the dopamine, serotonin, hormone production overall in our gut even stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how nutrition really, and then, you know, and then you can, um, I'm not saying you can eat your way out of depression, but it's it's part of the protocol. And I think um, when, when we're just so focused on just taking antidepressants, but people are still struggling, it's this other lifestyle part that really needs to be addressed and that's the food. And there's a whole um, division of medicine called uh, nutritional neuropsychiatry now. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so, which really connects how nutrition impacts our um, brain health and our um, mood and um, and mood disorders as well. Yeah, fascinating. That rich. That's a whole topic in itself, but very rich in terms of you know so many people dealing with the PMS, the agitation, the depression, and it's just a roller coaster. But maybe a lot of that would be attenuated by addressing the gut. Yeah, and so how you know, and I'm going to get into some of the heart, um, the good. Um, gut friendly and hormone friendly foods, but there are just a couple of things I also wanted to address that other things that impact women's health. Um, so by like by tenfold and um, that's environmental toxins. And so, you know, I say to people who are really trying to kind of get their health in order, I say, pick one thing, pick nutrition, pick the toxins, pick um, either exercise, pick one thing, get it really get a good routine with it, get it down and then address the next thing um, to start cleaning up your lifestyle for your health. And our hormones are really, really sensitive. Um, they are really respond to our environment. Um, and so environmental toxins, um, they are at the root of a lot of those invisible illnesses that women experience like autoimmune disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, than men. Um, and women also report to have more allergic reactions, respiratory ailments, skin hypersensitivity, um, more affected by pollution than my men. Um, you know, I know we don't, I know we're all over the masking. I definitely am, but I think there is a great benefit to masking also is that when we go outside, especially in um, really polluted areas, that mask can kind of provide us a layer of protection a little bit so we're not breathing it in. I'm in California and we have crazy wildfires and I definitely pull out um, and we've had wildfires way before the pandemic and I, I have started wearing those masks every time I had to go out when the air was so thick outside um, with wildfire smoke. Um, so it's really important to protect ourselves. I say one of the best things to protect yourselves from environmental toxins, because they're everywhere um, and they accumulate. You know, women, before they even step out of the house, they put on like 200 different chemicals on their bodies. Just thinking about lotions, hair, hair care products, and then makeup, you know, just all of those things if you count it. So even, you know, as with your food, you, the the body products, personal care products, you want to keep the ingredient list as simple as possible, you know, just use, I, I mean, like and give up the lotion and just use like something like shea butter or coconut oil or almond oil to nourish your skin To you know, you don't need the lotions. A lot, a lot of them are just full of chemicals. Um, and they, in long term, and your skin is a, a, one of your largest organs, and it absorbs. Um, you know, you absorb all of that into your body. Even your makeup. There's now, you know, a whole line of products called Green Green Clean Beauty, and lots of um, options now out there. Even, um, you know, you can go super high end with it, but even places like Target has um, clean beauty options. And when it comes to stuff like that, you just want to make the best uh, choice possible from what is available to you. Another way to reduce environmental uh, toxin burden is by um, having an, a really good air filter, you know, investing in an air filter that you have running all the time um, that can just really help um, with the air that's around you because actually our home is our homes are really toxic. Um, our, our like mattress, our clothing, our um, any stuffed pillows. If you have, um, you know, cheap furniture, um, it's giving off vapors and VOCs. Paint is even, uh, paint gives off um, vapors that we're all inhaling and carpets. Carpets are really, toxic also so you know um just making sure you have oh, you know if you can open your windows and air out your home almost every day and also having um air filters can really help you uh reduce that toxic burden and the other thing my favorite thing are plants 
So if you Google NASA's uh, air, like air pollutant plants or something like that, it will come up. And NASA actually, I don't know why, but NASA actually researched um, like about 20 plants that help fight environmental pollution. And these plants are amazing because you can't really kill them. I mean, you can't, you know, they're fairly low maintenance, um, you know, and as long as you don't put them in the burning sun and overwater them, they, they kind of thrive on their own. And so things like called like the snake plant um, or lily, um, the lily plant, all of those are really good at fighting environmental toxins. And so have them in your cubicle, have them in your office, have at least one to two plants per room um, to help fight that burden. Another important thing is breast health. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of emphasis on breast health and um, some of the things that we can do for breast health is massaging your breast daily um, and, um, and breaking a sweat, meaning um, exercising, because when we're exercising, we're releasing a lot of toxins that are built up in our body. So making sure you get your sweat on, whether that's by like going in the infrared sauna or going, you know, for a walk or an, a, a gym class. A seasonal cleanse is a good thing, like picking out one week at the beginning of every season. And, and I'm not saying like do a juice fast or a water fast, but maybe like a sugar, you know, it's like for this one week, I'm really not going to eat any sugar or any coffee. And it kind of helps lighten the burden on your body again. Um, and um, kind of doing a, a minor cleanse. I, I'm not into the big cleanses. I don't think they're appropriate for everyone. I'm not into like big fast. I think you have to work with a, a dietitian or nutritionist if you want to do something like that. But something like, you know, really like having like, um, you know, like dry January, you know, when you kind of give up drinking alcohol for the month, you could do that for a week, every quarter and say, you're not going to have any alcohol any sugar, maybe any caffeine and just see how your body responds. Or if there's something you've been meaning to test out, like, Hey, I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking dairy might be a trigger for my allergies. Maybe I'll give up dairy for this one week and see. Staying hydrated is really, really important because it helps us flush out toxins, but it also helps with digestion also, and keeping our skin supple. A big one for breast health specifically is avoiding commercial deodorant. I say if you could avoid deodorant, um, just avoid it. Um, and, um, and there are a lot of alternative deodorants. The problem with commercial deodorants is, again, they're full of chemicals. And um, a lot of them are linked to um, breast health concerns and like aluminum. And, and so we really want to avoid that. I, in all my years, I have not found one deodorant that will help me like combat East Coast heat, you know, or something like really muggy heat. And so um, on when I am in a situation where like I'm going to a wedding or somewhere where like, you know, I just really don't want to have sweaty, stinky armpits, I will use um, a commercial, like the cleanest of the commercial deodorants because they do work the best. But that's like, three or four times a year versus every single day. Um, and practicing yoga and another type of uh, yoga and a med spiritual practice called Yoni Shakti. And that, that really, it, you can look it up. It, and I am a Yoni Shakti practitioner also and been certified, but all of those can really help you address, um, you know, help prevent breast health um, cancer and help you manage a lot. Even like if you have breast tenderness, like if your breast tend to um, become swollen and tender throughout the month, um, that could be an indication of estrogen dominance. And that could be like, why are, why do you, why is your body not, um, why, why are you building up estrogen in your body? And it could be because you may not be pooping regularly. You should be pooping one to two times a day and nice healthy poops, not just little pebbles. Um, and when we poop, we actually, um, we excrete out 
um, we poop out all of the estrogen, the excess estrogen that our body has already, um, you know, it's gone through the liver, it's gone through the gut, and now you poop it out. If you are constipated, what happens with that estrogen is that it gets reabsorbed in your body and re, um, kind of recycled in your body. So now you have excess estrogen pumping and floating, circulating in your body because your body is going to pump out its normal amount that it's set to pump out every day. And then now you have that extra circulating one if you haven't pooped. So making sure that you get your gut health in order so you're pooping. And so this is another way how gut health is related to estrogen as well. Um, I want to really emphasize heart health because even though we have like a whole awareness for breast cancer awareness, which is really targeted at women. And then February is heart, um, heart health awareness. But when we talk about heart health awareness, the focus is really on men um, and not enough women are, you know, brought into the conversation when it comes to um, heart health. And, you know, doctors have finally ruled that menstrual cramps are as painful as heart attacks, you know, um, back in the day. I and mean, even now, a lot of doctors, you go and you say, oh my God, my periods, my cramps are really bad. They, they kind of think you're hysterical or you're making it up and give you an aspirin tell you go to tell you to go home. And this is happening today. And unfortunately, um, um, women of color, black women are more at risk for medical dismissal, basically, when it comes to menstrual health, when it comes to heart health. So they're at even more at risk of um, adverse events. And so we really need to recognize that one, um, women in general are not taking us seriously when you go to the doctor's office, and two, um, black women and then um, um, brown women, like Asian women, are um, at more risk, like medical risk than white women, and so um, we need, I don't know, <laughs> that's a whole nother conversation, but, uh, just knowing that, um, you know, hopefully we can advocate for ourselves more at the doctor's office. Um, something to note when it comes to heart health is that women experiencing heart attacks, they have completely different symptoms than men do. Women's symptoms, um, come on a few days earlier, um, they look like panic disorder. Um, they, the pain is actually radiates in the back and the neck as well, not just traveling up the left arm. And, um, and a lot of doctors may not even be aware of how different, um, it looks for a woman having a heart attack versus a man having a heart attack. Um, but they're equally at risk and um, heart attacks, cardiac events are the number one killer in the United States. States, not breast cancer, not, you know, um, obesity, it's, it's um, heart attacks. And so men and women are equally at risk, but women um, have a higher risk of dying from a heart attack just because they didn't get the proper care. Okay, so um, just now moving on to the diet part, which is really important, right? Because diet can help you prevent, but also reverse. I mean, uh, in all my time as a nutritionist, I've worked with so many people who were actually able to get off of their cholesterol medication, who are able to reverse their diabetes, who are able to, you know, normalize their periods and go on um, to have, you know, pain-free periods, go on to have babies, all by really just changing their diet um, and their lifestyle. And it's not as, e you know, nothing is really easy. It's something you have to dedicate yourself to, but it's also recognizing that there's no one size fits all kind of a diet. Um, we have to take into genetics. We have to take in um, ancestry, we have to take into environment and all of that when we're talking about diets, but following your intuition, your hung hunger cues and cravings can tell you a lot about the diet plan that you need to list, uh, follow. Generally following an anti-inflammatory diet can have profound health benefits for your entire health. So an anti-inflammatory diet is one that is very minimal in processed sugar. So, and sugars have like 
hundreds of different names, um, but you know, you really want to read the ingredient labels of any package. And um, if sugar in any form shows up in the first five ingredients, you know, it's a sugar loaded um, food product. Other thing is changing the type of fats you eat, you know, um, healthy fats versus unhealthy fats. So we all, um, we've been led to believe that, you know, um, canola oil, vegetable oil, all of those are healthy fats, but those are actually are very damaging fats, especially for women. They drive up the estrogen um, imbalance. They, they can, you know, they can really screw up your hormones because women's bodies, we need healthy fats to function. Um, fat is responsible for um, producing a lot of our hormones. It's responsible for having healthy periods. And so if we're not nourishing ourselves with the right type of fats, um, everything is going to go out of sync. So I say, go look into your pantry and um, remove anything that's uh, a commercial uh, oil, like canola oil, anything that's hydrogenated, anything that's trans, cottonseed oil, palm oil, um, uh, peanut oil, I would, uh, corn oil, soybean oil, all of those are terrible for you. Instead, cook with olive oil, cook with, you know, cook with what your ancestors were cooking with 100, 150 years ago, which were really, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of variety, but there, that's all they needed, you know, and um, all, like olive oil, coconut oil, um, nut and seed oil. You don't cook with those because if you uh, introduce high temperatures to them, then they'll get rancid and oxidized and then become trans fed. But you could dr dr drizzle those on top of food. Um, and then eating fatty foods is not a bad thing in the absence of sugar. Um, so like, you know, a nice piece of salmon, you know, and olives, um, even red meat. I'm not opposed to red meat as long as it's healthy. Like, you know, it's, it's not been injected with a bunch of hormones and food dyes, but um, come from like organic sustainable sources that, that can be a really healthy, healthy source of protein and fat. Um, but again, the key is to not um, carb load and with the high fats, because when you have a high carbohydrate food and then like, let's say like, um, like mashed potatoes and, um, and like garlic bread, and then a piece of steak, your body's going to use up all of the, the easier to process food, like the carbohydrates, and then the fat is going to be stored and you won't digest that as well. So you really want to make a balance, you know, and then the carbohydrates you're also eating, you don't want them to be quick to be sugar like bread or mashed potatoes it's better to actually eat like chopped up potatoes roasted potatoes than mashed potatoes because it's almost like a liquid form of potatoes so just things like that um this here was a sample meal day like a hormone balancing um like how, what you would eat in a day um obviously this is ideal and you would have to do the best that you can um but this is something to strive for and I don't have portion sizes here. I never do. I don't think portion size, you know, calorie counting really works. It's all about understanding how full you are. And, um, and once you become full, okay, stopping. And then if you're like hungry 30 minutes later again, either your meal wasn't um, nutritious enough, you know, keeping your, um, like it doesn't have enough fiber or vitamins and minerals in it, or it could be an insulin issue. So recognizing that um, it's not, may not be necessarily that you need to eat more. And I find that a lot of women don't actually overeat, they undereat. Um, so making sure you're actually eating enough, like, you know, a, a regular plate full of like, um, you know, we don't need to shy away from food. It's not less is not more when it comes to like trying to lose weight and get healthy. Um, you need to have, you need to have the right amount of calories, the right amount of uh, macro and micronutrients um, to even lose weight.
just a sample of like what um, some really great superfoods that you can add in. Um, I know the image is a little small, but like, you know, incorporating things like rose, um, rose petals, rose tea. Um, um, that's like a superfood, but it's so nice. And it's um, used in like Ayurvedic medicine to really calm down inflammation, um, build up blood. That's nice. Cacao. Um, so, you know, women love chocolate. We love chocolate. Why? It's actually a superfood. It's it's one of the richest sources of iron and magnesium, the two nutrients um, women really need, um, especially during their period. So when you're choosing cacao, um, have it in its purest form or eat as dark chocolate as possible without any chemical additives. Blueberries and most berries are superfoods, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory. Um, green tea, turmeric, fermented foods, all of that, pasteurated eggs. Eggs are um, full of nutrients and vitamins and minerals and eggs are a complete protein. So I do recommend eggs as long as you're not allergic to them. Carb cravings, um, even, um, you know, what carb cravings really mean is that it's a, it's a natural stress response. Um, it's also a sign from the gut brain to increase serotonin. Um, we do biologically crave more carbs closer to our period because of the increased um, metabolic resting rate. Um, other things to know about carb cravings that could be an indication of sleep deprivation also, or a response to low grade chronic pain. I mean, how many of us are in pain all the time and we've just gotten used to it, right? Um, and our body's way to kind of compensate for that pain is to boost up more serotonin. So your body is not really asking for donuts or cookies um, or even a bowl of cereal. What your body is really asking for when you do have a, a carb craving is things like sweet potatoes again, um, like a, a, a nut seed butter and jam sandwich, um, more like um, buckwheat, whole grains, those are naturally sweeter foods. And so some, these are some ideas here, like dark chocolate and berries, um, eating more protein will kind of help with that carb craving also and satiate and balance, um, keep your insulin a little more stable. Drinking herbal tea, like red raspberry leaf tea, can also help with the carb craving. And I love red raspberry leaf tea because it does help tone the uterus. Um, so even in postmenopausal, it's a really great tea, but if you're um, just menstruating, how, drinking this tea almost every day can help alleviate a lot of um, PMS symptoms. Supplements, when we talk about women's health, um, just, you know, my suggestion is that taking a multivitamin, multimineral, super high quality um, is pretty good enough for most um, women. I think we should all be taking one, just one. We're under a lot of stress. Um, you know, it, um, these last few years have been very, very stressful. And we don't, no matter what, even if you were like living on a farm and just getting all your food every day, um, fresh from the backyard, you're still not going to meet your daily requirements, especially if you've had years of, um, deficiencies. So that is why I think supplements are really, really important. Um, you want to look for quality. Um, don't just go, um, don't just go to like CVS or, um, your big box chain store and pick up whatever is on sale, like quality really matters. I say it's better to take a, a more expensive, higher quality supplement two to three times a week than a, a terrible product every single day. Because now if you're taking a terrible product, um, you're also putting a burden on your liver and you're um, increasing that toxic burden um, that we talked about earlier. Um, it really, I think supplements also have to be personalized. So I don't just 
say, hey, take this supplement. But um, in general, vitamin D3 and K2, about 2000 IUs can be really beneficial for women, especially if you have an autoimmune condition um, or in general, you like have aches and pains. I have found um, that um, pain is associated with vitamin D3 deficiency. And I, I really think that's one that's across the board everyone can use. I have one here. I don't know if you can see in the screen my picture. Um, it's a liquid one and really just like one drop um, gives you a thousand IUs. And um, that's, you know, a couple of those drops daily can be really great. I like liquid form because it absorbs better and it tends to not interact with other medication. Um, Magnesium is another great one for women, especially if you're experiencing a lot of cramping, about 600 milligrams a day. This right here is my link to where you can get the higher quality supplements and my suggestions. Like I, I broke it down to gut health, hormonal health, prenatal health, all of that, and you can find it. There's a lot of hype out there nowadays, taking like ancient medicines and putting them in supplement form. Like this company just sent me a bottle right here and it's using things like Chinese herbs, Indian herbs. And um, this company is not so bad, but I see a lot of them out there. Um, there's another one called, um, what is it called? Something Moss. Um, something moss, but it's, it's green moss, maybe it's super big out on the market. And I'm just saying, be really careful because, um, the way they're selling the supplements are not really the way they're actually meant to be taken. And it can do more harm than good. And you have to really look for the quality assurance. Um, we talked about pooping daily. Another important thing is um, emotional well-being. So making space to feel your wide range of emotions. It's normal. It's normal for women to be angry and happy and, and kind of have a, a, a cycle of emotions. And I think we repress it so much because society has told us that, no, we need to be stoic. We need to pardon ourselves if we need to be if we want to be successful we can't bring emotions into it and I think that's absolute BS um, you know we need emotional releases um, to help us process things stuck in our body and there are really really great books about this like um, one is called emotion code another one's called the body keeps score and it really talks about how if we don't process our emotions, it can lead to illnesses like autoimmune conditions. And there's a true thing called broken heart syndrome. It's, it's actually a real thing. Doctors recognize it. And um, it's all related to a lot of stress that has not been addressed. Um, and so feel the joy, feel the sadness and all that is in between in its fullness. Um, and I think looking at our menstrual cycle, we're given a chance to get super emotional every month, get wild with our thoughts. Um, and I, I think, you know, our menstrual cycle is a time to really, you know, maybe that's nature's way for us to release it, you know, not only we're releasing the blood, but also releasing emotions. And then, you know, we can kind of start over again, clean slate, um, and so, and I just want to say one more thing, suppressing our emotions, it, means also suppressing our identity and numbing our emotions also means numbing our authentic self. And um, I feel like at, at the core of a lot of women's health issues is this key principle because we're trying to fit into a man's world. Um, you know, it's like trying to put a star shape into a box, <laughs> just won't fit. Just to sum it up, some, um, some suggestions is sleep well and enough, um, making sure you're getting some kind of daily movement, eating lots of gut healthy foods, including probiotics, making sure you're pooping daily, and you're also engaging in self-pleasure. Um, and then, you know, um, and then so now I can stop here for questions if you have any, and um, we can get into a little bit of a discussion if you wanted to. And if you have more questions about your own personal health or just things like that, you can email me, happy to answer them. Um, 
or if you wanted to sign up for a one on one. Yeah. And I'll put in my email address in the chat box. Does anyone have any questions? I like the fact that you've integrated a lot of information, a lot of things that kind of can weigh down on, you know, optimal women's health, um, especially the toxins and the exogenous, I mean, the environmental toxins and things like that. But when you're talking about estrogen dominance and things like breast cancer and all kinds of problems with PMS, um, the, I guess the toxin, toxic weight in the body is very difficult because when we think about eliminating excess estrogen, estrogen rather, not only through the constipation and, and improving your bowel movements, but also you know the ability to cleanse it through the liver more, more, mm. uh, in a, not an accelerated way, but uh, allow the liver to process and remove it, you know, as well, or get it into the um, the gut. So sometimes I guess the toxins can really create kind of um, a static nature in the in the, the liver as well. Um, so I guess lowering the toxic load, but is there anything else you could be doing too um, in terms of just helping to eliminate more toxins out of the body? Is there any other um, mm -hmm. concepts that we might be able to think? Yeah. So there's a lot of things we cannot control in life, right? Um, but there are a few things we can really be active about. It's like what we put in our body and on our bodies, you know? Um, and so, you know, I've already gone over that, but we also want to support our liver through this and supporting our liver by supporting our liver. We're really supporting our gut health also. So eating more herbs, you know, um, herbs like cilantro, oregano, basil, all of those are really powerful foods and, um, and that have that support the liver, that actually help the liver do its job, <clears throat> which is so amazing because when we're talking about even spices and herbs, we're not eating a cup full of cilantro. We're having only a sprinkling on our food. But as long as we have a sprinkling with every serving, um, that can be a really great way. Other things is making sure you're drinking pure uh, unfiltered uh, water. Our our water is really full of a lot of toxins too, especially if you have old pipes. So just um, getting a water filter, even if it's a basic one, like a, a Brita, um, it's better than nothing. So um, drinking clean water and, and sticking to water. Like we don't need to drink much else. We don't need to drink sodas and um, any other beverages, I think like water and some herbal teas, it's a really, really great way. Um, drinking like dandelion root tea or marshmallow tea, that can also really help um, with that. Um, breathing, so the way we breathe, you know, um, and so making sure we're expelling our breath, a lot of us are just shallow breathing. So just like really filling up our lungs and exhaling and engaging in breathing exercises a few times a day can be really a really powerful way to um to expel a lot of the toxins especially from our lungs um and so those are just some of the ways that we can help our liver as well um to reduce that uh, toxic load, but it's also um, giving our entire body. I feel like, you know, if we're not, if we're not doing um, a lot of these things, and we're only, um, we're only, we're like, we're only like taking the medicines that we need to take. Um, it's almost like a losing game, right? Because the toxic burden, it's just so great so great especially if you live in a city where there's lots of commuters or if you're living close to a farmland where they're using a lot of pesticides um you know it's just we got to do everything we can to reduce that toxic burden yeah which brings to the point of pesticides too trying to eat as you said cleaner cleaner food uh, removing the pesticides um you know a lot of times we can't always get access to organic or this and that but even making sure we're cleaning the vegetables well if we have to buy you know the traditional pro you know non-organic or whatnot you yeah know. 
I, in the chat box, I just put in the clean 15 and dirty dozen. So the clean 15 is the top 15 um, uh, produce that have the least amount of pesticides uh, sprayed on them. So if those are the foods that you cannot get organic, it's pretty okay. And the dirty dozen is the top 12 foods that have the most pesticides, like apples. I think they're like apples are number one or number two. And Strawberries are, yeah. Yeah, they have like 54 pesticides on them. Uh, for those, I'm like, if they're not organic, I don't want to eat it. I don't, I don't care how delicious it looks. I just don't want to eat it because it's not worth the the toxic burden in my body. I mean, it's just, it's not just about that. Like we, headaches, you know, sinus congestion, migraines, and um, all of these um, joint pains, all of that's related to this, um, the toxic overload. Yeah, so the herbs and the other things are a great, great concept too. You know, and I, know I, I used to hear the adage, the bitter, the better, you know, with the herbs, whether it's green, darker green vegetables, you know, broccoli, rab, uh, you know, things that just almost somewhat a little bit bitter, but actually can be quite detoxifying as well. Okay. It's true, <laughs> right? Bitter foods um, usually indicated poisons, nice. um, you know, out in the wild. And so like, we would, um, you know, hunter gather societies, they would gravitate towards the sweeter things because they knew the more bitter it is, the more toxic it could be. Um, but, you know, we also know like things like dandelion grains and all those are pretty safe to eat um, and they're bitter and because they help detox our body. And we don't, you know, that's another thing. We have all these taste buds and we don't utilize all of the taste buds and bitter is one of them. And so just making sure to eat one to two bitter foods a day can be um, a nice way to, you know, green tea, something like green tea is actually really bitter. It doesn't taste so bitter when you put it in water, but it's actually bitter. Um, spices, a lot of spices are bitter too, yeah. Excellent. And Namisha, was it green tea that you were stating is good to have regularly for your menstrual flow? Um, red raspberry leaf tea. I'll type it in here. Um, that is amazing um, for menstrual, for PMS, basically, but and toning your uterus. So even if you like have fibroids or you've had any kind of surgery, um, that's really great. And just a lot of people notice the difference if they drink it for 30 days and just in that 30 days um, that, but green tea is also really great because it's full of L-theanine and all these antioxidants. So a cup of green tea in the morning is also really great. Great. Um, and I know you said um, fibroid and it's something that we've been seeing more and more, especially in our NYC communities. Can you tell me about, you know, maybe something simple that maybe many women should know, you know, either to shrink or to help, you know, with their current fibroid situation? Yeah. The number, cause I do a lot of patient advocacy thing. And the number one I want, thing I want to say that there are a lot of options that are not um, surgery related when it comes to, or hysterectomies. Um, and so really, you know, whoever's going through that, make sure, making sure the doctor's updated with the latest technology also. Um, and then in terms of shrinking, you really wanna do an anti-inflammatory diet and low um, foods that have low estrogen. So really um, for fibroids, you do wanna minimize the amount of red meat. You don't have to be vegan, you, you don't, cause you may need the protein, but um, like red meat um, and making sure like your eggs are all pasture raised. Um, mm. And then again, eating things that'll help you poop um, because it's pooping will help get rid of some of the estrogen. Gotcha. Yeah. Are fibroids also related to, and well, I don't know if this is true, is correct, but um, skipping periods and things like that, is there a correlation between mm, buildup of, of fibroid as well? Or I'm not sure if there's a connection there though. Actually. Um, well, usually if you have a fibroid, you're bleeding more heavily yes. and for longer periods. PCOS is a condition where you would be um, skipping periods yeah. Um, yeah. or having elongated cycles, yeah. 
Um, and then so with fibroids, you making sure you're eating enough iron rich foods because typically um, fibroids, um, they get so large and you bleed so heavily that you tend to become anemic. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Is it um, okay to my 10 year old granddaughter mm -hmm. started her menstrual? <laughs> and is it okay to like give her the raspberry tea or the green tea? Um, on a consistent basis, I mean, to help her? Yeah, I mean, for, a, a, you know, you know, I started my period when I was 10 too. And I, you know, it's like that time where you're, you're still a child. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend green tea just cause it's high in caffeine um, and kids are already pretty energetic at that time. I, I would, do red raspberry leaf tea, like maybe half a cup or a diluted cup. Um, it, it doesn't need to be as concentrated. So, you know, instead of uh, steeping the tea bag for a good five minutes, only steep it for two minutes. And it's it would be really helpful. And if your, um, you know, your granddaughter is um, experiencing menstrual pain, um, using things like uh, castor oil packs, um, and, and magnesium for pain relief instead of Advil um, can be really great because magnesium also one, it, I mean, it does so many things, but it does help you poop. It re relaxes your muscles and it has no impact on your gut health versus Advil actually um, can lead to leaky gut and impact your liver as well. Um, and so you don't want to have that dependency early on. Thank you. Yeah, you're Thank welcome. You. And I guess the magnesium has a little bit of a muscle relaxant quality too to help with the, I guess, the issues of the cramping and things like that. Yeah, magnesium is, you know, when someone has a heart attack, what they do is they flood your body with magnesium. Um, and and so, cause that's what's going to relax the heart. And, um, and so it is a powerful muscle relaxant. Mm -hmm. At 10 years old, you probably want to take 100 milligrams. Awesome. That is so good to know. Namisha, we can't thank you enough for always just stopping in and giving us so much education when it comes on to women's health. We know it's not just, you know, we can't fill everything in our one hour. And we hope to have you back just to continue us on this path of um, women's health and healing and, you know, how do we get healthy in our communities and providing us with so much resources. Thank you for dropping that information in the chat. Um, we look forward to having you again. I hope everyone enjoys today's session with Namisha. Please, if you need to reach her out, Namisha, what is your social media handles or your website where, you know, people can locate you? So on Instagram, I'm at Moon Cycle Nutrition, and I do um, have really great content there. I've I've interviewed um, a really great um, OBGYN, uh, Dr. Cindy Duke, and we talk about all sorts of things about periods. So if you go into my Instagram, it's all there, and my website is MoonCycleNutrition.com. Awesome. And we can't thank you enough. Please follow Namisha on Moon Cycle Nutrition on her Instagram, but also visit the website as well, because that's where, you know, all the good content is along with her social media. And if you have any follow-ups, definitely um, just check out the website and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you everyone for joining us for today's session and we'll see you next time. Yes, thank, thank you. you.